aperture. So I'm going to show, um, perhaps this is my political talk, uh, I'm going to show a series of um, interconnected projects that um, definitely um, focus on the theme of politics. Um, and um, the last piece, which I'm going to end with, is actually um, incredibly new. In fact, it still hasn't uh, seen its, uh, its gallery debut. In fact, it's going to be shown uh, in July at uh, Thomas Schultz Gallery in Berlin. So um, I'll end with this new body of work, um, which is uh, still perhaps a little bit in progress, although the film and the suite of photographs that you're going to see So I want to start by saying that my, my current practice is the product of a seven-year hiatus from making work. From 1994 until 1998, I had a fairly typical postgraduate experience. I made work and showed regularly, and then life gained the upper hand. And perhaps this is actually a nice connection to um, the professional practices, um, which this talk is a component of. Um, it takes a while to Get, uh, get the motor turned over after, after graduating, but you know, don't, uh, uh, it eventually does happen. <laughs> um, so I made work and showed regularly and then life gave the upper hand. Um, I went back to making work again in 2005 with the desire to differentiate my practice from my prior approach and to create a way of working that was both deliberate and sustainable. This piece here is, uh, and I'll just insert the titles of the works uh, as the slides go by. Uh, this piece is called Music Room at the Farm School, the Farm, Summertown, Tennessee. And this piece is called Inoculation Room at Mushroom People, the Farm, Summertown, Tennessee. La Belle Poussin writes in Af African Nomadic Architecture, to understand nomadic boundaries, we need to think of the built environment and its spaces in the context of movement the movement of people, the movement of one's world of material culture. Movement, however, is also an essential part of our cognitive experience. For the nomad, home cannot be understood except in terms of journey, just as space is defined by movement. As our reference points change, so too does our point of view. This is Snake Butte, uh, Fort Belknap Reservation, Montana. From the outset, I tried to find an, uh, an open-ended conceptual framework that allowed for a variety of engagements, a series of nodes within a broad, interconnected continuum. Some nodes then branch off and subdivide with greater complexity than others. Classroom, at Stone, Col at Stone Child College, Rocky Boys Reservation, Montana 1. Looking back at my notes, I found this statement written in 2005, although I didn't show the result in work until 2008. Develop a system of image making threaded by twin impulses. One, the romantic tradition of picturing the world. The other, an examination of forces affecting that world. Greenhouse, used by Earthworks, Detroit Agricultural Network and Growing Healthy Kids. Earthworks Urban Farm, Detroit, Michigan. I made a list of possible sites. Pavilion, Folly, Hermitage, Belvedere Platform Precinct. Station, Classroom, Library, School of Thought, Office, Conference Room, Headquarters, Company Town, Club, Sanctuary, Food Bank, Garden, Greenhouse, Nursery, Commune, Refugee Camp, Special Economic Zone, Garden City, Silicon Valley, Rust Belt, Reserve, Reservation, Institute, Complex, Union, Think Tank, Foundation. The idea was to create a spectrum of ideologically differentiated sites. And in fact, because I'm not interested in the site's conceptual, because I'm only interested, in fact, in the site's conceptual value, I'm never sure of its potential to yield something of visual interest. Marginal Way Skate Park, Seattle, Washington, one. I'm interested in the specificity of a place. What narratives and ideologies does it reveal? How do the personal and public commingle? what individual traces contribute to or detract from the overall manifestation of an ideal. Urban Farm at the Catherine Ferguson Academy for Pregnant and Parenting Teens, Detroit, Michigan. David Trottin, 
a member of the French architecture firm Perifique, writes in Customize, the review of peripheral architecture in 2002, we find ourselves with pieces of cities, bits of urban utopias of sorts, that don't work, but that have become real in turn because life has gained the upper hand and we have to make do. Belvedere. This is actually an installation shot from the, the Ocean of Images show at MoMA. Belvedere is a group of photographs in the title of my most recent book, uh, published by Dominica and New Documents. It was on view last year at MoMA as part of the new photography exhibition, Ocean of Images. The text was written by Berlin-based architect and theorist Marcus Niesen. The subject of the work is the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, a conservative free market think tank and the originators of the Overton window, and in many ways the inventors of Donald Trump, or at least the possibility that someone like him could be politically successful. Cubicles at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, Midland, Michigan. The title stems from a desire to relate the architectural folly, the Belvedere, to a public policy tool, the Overton window. Specifically, I was interested in the Renaissance practice of using an architectural device to frame and order the natural environment. This framing and the result in asceticization effectively suggests a value proposition. What is in the frame is worth considering and beautiful. What lies outside the frame is worthless and ugly. Healthcare overflow files at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, Midland, Michigan. The principle of the Overton window is to shift radical policy to actionable policy. Functionally, it, it, it works by suggesting the extreme, so the less extreme seems reasonable in comparison. And to give a better example of that, if gas, if you want gas to uh, be at five dollars a gallon and it's currently at three dollars a gallon, you raise the price to seven dollars a gallon, and then when you bring it back to five, it seems reasonable in comparison. Joseph P. Overton, Memorial Library at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, Midland, Michigan. When engaging a site, one of the things that excites and interests me is the interest between the ideological position of a site and how the space actually defines itself. That gap between one's experience of the space and one's knowledge of the activities that actually go on there. What's amazing about the physical structure of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy is its ruthless efficiency. It's the cockroach of architecture, highly adaptable and entirely lacking in affect, a clean room for ideas. Videotapes at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, Midland, Michigan. What's considered is how certain historical ideologies have become ordered, commodified, and instrumentalized, occasionally even weaponized, as they're selected and brought forward. Mutable, responsive, and networked. The center acts as a clearinghouse for strategies, collecting, developing, articulating, and then distributing specific responses to given social and economic conditions. For everyone, a garden. Uh, I'd like to show a diptych uh, from a body of work that I produced in 2013 entitled For Everyone, a Garden. Um, it established a more provisional approach, uh, a necessary response to the indexical rigidity of other preceding works. It allowed for a more speculative engagement with my subjects. This is a detail of the left panel. The work addresses the promise of modernism and its institutions, which still very much define the fabric of, of the contemporary neoliberal city. Mosh Safdie's 1974 book lent its title to the exhibition, and the architect Jean-Louis Chaniac's juxtaposable city of 1962 provided the basic form that ran overtly and covertly throughout. The drawings are based on digital collages that I had made and then provided to an illustrator who works for Marvel Comics. They're rendered as two five by seven foot photographic enlargements framed with colored film applied to the acrylic glazing. And then this is the right panel. I don't know if you can read it, but I'll, I'll read it out loud. The spontaneous acts of revolt forming everywhere must find a tactic that takes into account the spectacle's power of recuperation. Jason E. Smith writes um, in a recent issue of Grey Room, and some of you might recognize this as a quote actually by Guy Debord. Um, to speak, however, of the contemporary relevance of Debord's films, the question is simple. Why Debord filmmaker today? Is to assume in advance that one has, to ha one has at hand 
a usable definition of the contemporary. Art historical debates often cast about for defining dates or events, some opting for the global student and worker revolts of 1968, and others the 1989 collapse of the Soviet bloc. One might also speak of 1973 as a pivotal hinge, dating as it does both the point when the energy summoned in the struggles and revolts of the late 60s began to burn out, and the first signs of a capitalist restructuration Call it what you will, neoliberalism, post-Fordism, real subsumption, even a fully realized spectacle emerged to define our own present, up to and beyond the global crisis of 2007-2008. The Republic. This is an installation shot from David Nolan Gallery um, from 2014. The Republic is a representation of the speculative present. As a point of departure, it imagines the proposed city plans of Greek urban planner Konstantinos Doxiadis for both Athens and Detroit. Doxiadis' The Capital of Greece project began in earnest in 1955, was intended to bring some order to the, to the explosive post-war growth and urbanization that Athens was experiencing. In 1965, he was commissioned by Detroit Edison to lead the Developing Urban Detroit Area Research Project as a component of the growing Great Lakes megalopolis region. At the heart of his consultancy was the UNIVAC Doxiadis Associates Computer Center, one of the largest and most technologically advanced in Europe. Fragment. Neither commission was realized due to changing social and political conditions. The fall of the military junta in 1974 and the Detroit riots of 1967 changed the historical trajectory of both cities. What's compelling is Doxiadis' involvement at critical turning points in both histories. What's exposed are the cracks in the firmament that perhaps led to their current status. Another point of reference is the architect, urban planner, and developer John Portman, hired to imagine another future for Detroit. And actually, perhaps I'll like, back up just one second. Um, when I wrote this, um, um, I think the historical events were, were, were closer and more kind of um, present in our minds, but um, I actually shot uh, the Detroit and the um, Athens components of the film, which you'll see in the photographs, um, at the, the point um, of the Euro crisis uh, moment in, in Athens, um, also uh, the rise of the Golden Dawn, uh, the right wing Nationalist Party, and the uh, financial collapse and bankruptcy in Detroit. So those were kind of key historical markers, if you will, that I was responding to when making when making the work. And I forget that you know, the further we get away from that, the more kind of blurry it gets in people's minds, like, why then? Uh, so another point of reference is the architect, urban planner, and developer John Portman, hired to imagine another future for Detroit. He was commissioned by Henry Ford II and a consortium of civic leaders and investors to bring to the Midwest some of the innovations that he had deployed in Atlanta. His proposal was the Renaissance Center, an insular withdrawal solution to the elements of disinvestment, mismanagement, and depopulation that had plagued the city. This is uh, the Republic II. Both Athens and Detroit embody to some extent the failures of late capitalism and the neoliberal state. They have fraught and complex relationships with the concept of ruin. But the Republic doesn't dwell on this. Instead, it imagines the reality of their shared citizenry, moments that are grand and occasionally languid provisional yet full of hubris, congested, frustrated, and shot through with random acts of callous violence. But lastly, with the burden of history, their perseverance is transcendent. The Republic IV. The exhibition references the cinematic history of the late 60s and early, and early 70s, borrowing liberally from Debord's The Society of the Spectacle, Godard's Sympathy for the Devil, and Marker's uh, Le Fond de la Rouge and Sans Soleil. The concept of the film essay is annexed and spatialized. The Republic III. The exhibition involves various elements whose relationships suggest a loose constellation. Central is the film, The Republic, shot in both Athens and Detroit. The footage is montage, so the locations become indiscernible. And a hybrid city-state emerges. Musician Sam Precop composed the score and plays the role of the engineer, both performing and tweaking the city's parameters, how fast the traffic flows, how brightly the power grid burns. Interspersed at random moments throughout the film is a group of laborers who flip an automobile 
in a winter landscape as both an invocation of a myth of Sisyphus and a reenactment of civil disorder. In the gallery, sculptural forms derived from the architecture of John Portman create a public stage for viewing and discussion. Full-scale cast bronze acanthus plants sprout from the floor, hovering in a state between nature and monument. On the wall is a photograph of a cat who has begun to disappear under the glare of a, of a sodium vapor lamp, a witness, who a witness whose constant surveillance is testimony of a state that never blinks. Interval. The work was initially commissioned by LAX Art as part of their occasional project. I chose to cite the piece in the former flower shop at the Bonaventure Hotel, an icon of postmodernism and cited extensively in by Frederick Jameson in his essay, The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. The building, again, was designed by John Portman and, and completed in 1976. The site not only references the history of Southern California architecture and the post portis landscape that Los Angeles embodies, this deliberate siting attempts to annex the possibilities of architecture in a potentially post-ideological time. Jameson describes it as a total space, a complete world, a kind of miniature city, to this new total space, meanwhile, corresponds a new collective practice, a new mode in which individuals move and congregate, something like the practice of a new and historically original kind of hypercrowd. Interval is a film installation comprised of source material from two locations, Whitehorse uh, in the Yukon, and it's the subject of a white paper entitled The Squatters of Whitehorse by anthropologist and geographer James Lotz a protagonist in Glenn Gould's 1967 radio work, The Idea of North. He makes passing reference to the document in the work's narrative. It records the living conditions and habits of various individuals living in specific settlements around Whitehorse, from itinerant laborers involved in resource extraction to members of the Métis and First Nations community. The second location is Sakhalin Island, geographically part of the Japanese archipelago but Russian territory. It was a former penal colony and the subject of Anton Chekhov's only work of nonfiction, The Island, A Journey to Sakhalin. Historically contested territory with a diverse population ranging from Russians, Japanese, and Koreans to an indigenous population of Gilyak and Ainu. The work is a rigorous examination of the conditions and habits of the island's 19th century inhabitants. My interest in using these two locations has as much to do with Gould and Chekhov as it does with each site's conceptual potential as a marginal geography, with a singularly focused economy. Both figures found it necessary to find subjects on the periphery of their individual societies in order to find the critical distance uh, to comment on the center. The title interval re references uh, to both a shared harmonic result of two notes struck simultaneously and uh, spatial and temporal displacement. Rem Coolhouse writes in jump space. There are no walls, only partitions, shimmering membranes frequently covered in mirror gold. Jameson acknowledges the emergence of a new cultural and environmental archetype. The structure is emblematic of the emergence of the third stage of capitalism, the postmodern or the multinational. And even though he calls for a new form of artistic practice and cognitive mapping, he fails to acknowledge the emergence of a third kind, beings whose hybrid ethnography and experience of the world is as deracinated as the spaces they inhabit, virtually or otherwise. Perhaps this is the dream of Constant, a global nomadic population imprinting new narrative possibilities with every encounter, a permanent day to eve. Both Rem Coolhouse, both Rem Coolhouse um, in Junk Space and later Hal Foster in his symbiotic text Running Room assume some of the same insights and prejudices present, present rather, in uh, Jameson's text. It prioritizes the late capitalist understanding of architecture's potential and its prevailing neoliberal neoliberal narrative. So here the work shifts uh, to its installation last year at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, and this was actually really exciting for me to recontextualize the work. Um, 
And you can see um, the, the images, actually, there's um, two, um, two men um, on the, the mural wall. Um, and they were actually part of a publication um, in the Los Angeles iteration. Um, but in, in Chicago, um, I decided to print them on the, the mural wall. Um, and how, again, there was also the issue of how do you bring forward um, the relationship to the Bonaventure which I found to be kind of integral to an understanding of how the piece function. Um, so the wall here um, is actually an exact replica of the curtain wall from the, um, uh, from the Bonaventure Hotel. And in fact, um, I went back to, uh, or actually, uh, I worked with uh, Dirk Dennison Architects, which is an architecture firm in Chicago, and they reached out to John Portman's office, and Portman uh, provided us with uh, drawings of the Bonaventure Hotel, and then we went to Kownir, who actually fabricated the curtain wall and had them produce um, a scale a scale version of it. Um, so there's there's that kind of direct and, and physical connection to how the work was cited, and there was didactic text that supported that as well. <clears throat> so uh, the strategy of traveling to the periphery in order to understand uh, the pathologies of the center has to do more uh, with more than just a adopting the methodologies of, of Gould and Chekhov. Uh, perhaps the work addresses a new condition of constant hybridity, a prototypical hyperspace. It also has to do with our current understanding of decentralized global culture, the redistribution of wealth and power, and a poetic analysis of two communities who, as a result of the flow of global capital, are in the process of active myth-making and re-territorialization. Negative space. The genesis for negative space, the last poet, began with research into the work and artistic legacy of Robert Rauschenberg. After I was invited by his foundation to participate in a residency program. In the fall of 1980, Rauschenberg journeyed uh, from Long Island, New York to Captiva, Florida, where his studio was located. The images taken on that trip subsequently became some of the primary source material for his paintings and prints. Rauschenberg's camera was undiscerning, recording the banal reality of urban America. I began to relate his journey in the territory he covered to my own work and interests, specifically the conflicted legacies of the built environment and its relationship to various ideological positions. I was reminded of Peter Blake's seminal work, God's Own Junkyard a planned deterioration of America's landscape, a scathing book from 1964, which noted the emergence of urban sprawl and the slash and build process of development. Blake accepts and builds on a critique originally put forth by earlier theorists like Patrick Geddes and Lewis Mumford. These photographs are all from this new body of work, Negative Space. Alternative, alternatively, Jean Gottman's Megalopolis the urbanized northeastern seaboard of the United States from 1961 performs a clear analysis of the polynuclear region stretching from Boston to Washington. While initially critical, it attempts to plot a way forward and to think productively of the massing of capital, population, and resources. The complexity, complexity and interconnectedness of the area has grown in ways that neither Rauschenberg, Blake, Geddes, Mumford, nor Gottman could have imagined but it is with this new porousness that one begins to understand the present moment, defined by the reversal of urban to suburban migration patterns, the extreme concentration and stratification of wealth and power, the marginalization and displacement of industry, and the emergent precarity of environmental catastrophe. Samuel R. Delaney writes in Dahlgren about the fictitious city of Bologna. There are times as I wander in this abysmal mist, when these streets seem to underpin all the capitals of the world. At others, I confess the whole place seems a pointless and ugly mistake, with no relation to what I know as civilization, better obliterated than abandoned. William Gibson's Sprawl Trilogy, Neuromancer Count Zero, 
Mona Lisa Overdrive, written in the pre-World Wide Web late 80s, uh, took place partly in the vast construct of his imagination, which he coined as cyberspace. But mainly the narrative explored an expanded geographic region, the Boston Atlanta Metropolitan Axis, AMA, a fictitious extrapolation of Gottman's megalopolis, and perhaps a territory that most closely resembles our own convergent reality. Francis Fukuyama wrote in 2007 for an opinion piece in The Guardian, the European Union more accurately reflects what the world will look like at the end of history than the contemporary United States. And at least in theory, the EU represents the apex of, his, of this geopolitical condition. A, a, continent, a continent spanning make a region, make a region <laughs> uh, governed by a transnational liberal democracy whose prosperity is dependent on the free movement of labor and goods. Regardless of past, present, or future, or even location, the film is a way to dimensionalize the relationship between territory and a set of ideals and policies that govern specific outcomes. Procedurally, the work was filmed over a two-week period using a state-of-the-art drone, starting in the Boston metropolitan area and finishing in the vicinity of Atlanta. It focuses on urban and exurban areas that distinguish themselves through their ubiquity, ubiquity, rather than regional specificity. In addition to making the film, I worked on a suite of photographs. The film is narrated by Professor Francis Fukuyama, the Olivier Nomelani Senior Fellow and Director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law, Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. I conducted two days of interviews with him where we discussed a variety of topics, including proliferation of drone technology, its connection to the military industrial complex, and the moral implications of remote warfare. His interest in photography and audio recording, and consequently the value of historical records, their archiving and distribution. We also touched on the relationship between craft and modernity as a way of exploring the promise of industrialization and globalization. Lastly, we discussed themes central to his research on the history of liberal, democ liberal democracies and their current state of decay. The narrative is elliptical, broad-ranging, open-ended, and provisional, discursive rather than polemical. Returning to Rauschenberg, the film describes a journey, in this case from Boston to Atlanta and on through Bologna, an, asymmetri an asymmetrical, nonlinear itinerancy with neither beginning nor end. So I'll play a clip from, um, it's a little bit longer, it's seven minutes, uh, from um, my new film, The Last Poet. Um, and just to show of hands, who's familiar with, with uh, Francis Fukuyama? Heard of him? Two people. <laughs> um, so he, he wrote this book called The End of History and the Last Man, uh, which was, um, quite important at the time. It was written in 92, I believe, and it was in response to the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, in 1989 and the reunification of Germany. Um, and um, he's talking about um, the idea of, of liberal democracy as having, uh, for lack of a better word, beaten communism um, and it, it being the last standing and uh, apex, if you will, of um, kind of uh, yeah, government or governments. Um, and the, when the book came out, it was actually quite um, controversial. Um, and um, uh, he spent many years kind of living with that as his legacy. Um, he's since written two uh, incredibly interesting books um, on the history of, of liberal democracy uh, globally. Um, and. Uh, He's um, also politically, um, he was, um, after he graduated, um, he worked for the Rand Corporation and then uh, went to work for the, uh, the Bush administration and was one of the architects of the, uh, uh, the war in Iraq. Um, something that he's since uh, regretted um, and, and walked back uh, his position on. So he, he's quite a controversial figure and I think that uh, uh, the role that he's playing 
um, in the film as narrator. Um, I don't want to say a, an unreliable narrator, but I, I definitely I think that what he's saying is quite contentious and I think offers a very kind of clear provocation um, in terms of uh, how one sees uh, the current political landscape. So I wanted to just mention two things. Um, the first is that um, I'm incredibly grateful for Frank and his generosity in terms of, you know, um, having the conversation and offering up his point of view in such a, a frank and straightforward manner. Um, and the other thing is um, I got to work with a concert harpist, which was pretty fucking amazing. Um, that's it, thank you. <laughs> You just raise your hand, I have a mic, I'll run it to you. Hi, um, so like, can you talk more about that space between when you graduated and before you started making work again, and sort of like what that was like and um, how you got to the point where you are now, I guess, through that process? Sure, sure. Um, professional practices. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, I graduated in, I want to say, 96, I think, 1996, um, and I uh, was living in Chicago and um, uh, writing art criticism, um, working as a curatorial assistant at the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and, uh, and showing my work. Um, and it all made a kind of sense, um, but... Um, uh, after I had finished my internship, um, I was trying to figure out what to do next, and um, the art world's really difficult, and it's not exactly exactly fair. Um, and one of the things I teach currently, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania um, in the MFA program there. And one of the things that I really try and strive to do is to encourage a kind of diversity. And what I mean in that is not simply, I think, kind of the diversity that we get give lip service to um, in terms of, um, you know, um, a kind of, um, you know, racial diversity, but also diversity in terms of um, economics and also uh, kinds of practices, right? Um, that's something that for me is very, very important. And one of the things that I realized, um, you know, uh, after graduating was it was really difficult for, you know, um, you know, single black man um, from very modest means, you know, coming from Canada, not even having a kind of familial kind of um, uh, network to, to make my way in the art world. And I was looking for a way that I could begin to kind of support myself independently without, you know, having to ask for a kind of permission. Um, this was 96, 97, and um, I think you'll remember um, the internet was just kind of booming, becoming quite, um, a lot of the infrastructure uh, that we understand today was actually just being built at the time. Uh, so in my spare time, I actually taught myself how to code and design and um, uh, moved to New York uh, along with my girlfriend at the time. Um, and um, um, found work and actually became incredibly successful um, uh, working in that field, um, which I did for 17 years. Um, and I was a creative director, actually. Um, for a number of um, design and technology companies. Um, <laughs> um, but the, but the, the, it was a very difficult balance to strike. And in fact, I realized one of the things that I was actually terrified about was that um, my practice as an artist was something that was becoming more of a hobby as opposed to something that I was seriously committed to. And I was, I was dreading that, you know, that it would become this thing that I would you know, bring up at parties to in some kind of attempt to make myself seem more interesting. So I actually just said, like, no, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to be an artist. I'm going to focus on, you know, making a life for myself, um, which I did, as I said, for 17 years. Um, and um, I took 10 years away from my practice, and it was actually the birth of my uh, first son, Kappa, um, that um, encouraged uh, my wife, Catherine, and I to kind of re-examine our lives and think about what made us happy, and we owned a beautiful brownstone in Brooklyn, and you know, 
but we had to work full time in order to you know, make ends meet. And uh, we decided to sell the house and leave the city. And bizarrely, I had to leave New York in order to become an artist again. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think that you know, it touches on a number of themes that are very important, which is just kind of prioritizing your concerns, making sure that you're 100% serious about your, you know, what it is that you want to do, and not asking permission from anybody. So finding a kind of you know, um, a mechanism or infrastructure that allows you to support yourself um, and, and make your own decisions. Hello. Um, I was just wondering what the reason was um, behind uh, shooting this film on drone. I just uh... sure, sure. Well, I was thinking a lot about Rauschenberg, obviously, um, and he was shooting with a 35 millimeter camera. Um, I believe maybe in a, maybe um, you know a two and a quarter, um, but analog, you know, black and white. Um, and then you think about um, you know other photographers and the way that they were. You know, uh, capturing you know, the American urban landscape, you know, Robert Frank and the Americans and the Friedlander, and you know, working with these rangefinder cameras and Leicas. And um, I just, you know, that was leading edge technology at the time. So I was asking myself, you know, I didn't want to be retro. I didn't want to kind of fall back into that mode. So I was thinking, you know, how might somebody look at the landscape today? Um, so drone technology immediately kind of presented itself. But the other issue which is incredibly important is this issue of scale, right? So um, I actually think quite critically about um, framing um, and its relationship to the subject. And because this is about a region, I needed to kind of move far enough away from the subject in order to kind of uh, demonstrate the sc its scale. So that was another critical element uh, to be able to get up and show you know, this is a city, this is this is infrastructure, this is a group of citizens, yeah. Uh, as for the score, um, I was curious if, you know, what your influences were in directing the scoring of this video, um, what the percussiveness and the dissonance and whatnot in the earlier parts, and on the, you mentioned the harp, the concert harpist, and where did that kind of um, decision making came from? Oh, fantastic, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, so uh, Daniel came in to the studio with, a, as did Mitchell in the previous piece, um, and they came in with um, a, a score that the improvisers would, would uh, react to. Um, so we were capturing segments, um, different pieces. Sometimes we would play footage, sometimes they would just kind of work independently. Most of the time they would just work independently off of the score. Um, and uh, one of the things that I did when I was recording Frank in, in, in at Stanford was um, I was I was super nervous, super nervous, and um, as I was setting up, I was just like, all right, how can I make this kind of like super low tech, super straightforward? So I brought this little um, Zoom Handy recorder and I set it up on the table, and um, you know checked the levels and said everything's going great, and we're recording, and as we're as we're recording and he's you know responding in this amazing way. He keeps on nudging the table and kicking it. Um, and uh, I'd already recorded uh, room tone, like when nobody was talking. So there were really beautiful moments. I don't know if it came through of like typewriters clicking and voices in the background. Um, and I really loved that aspect, so I was already planning to include it. But then I had these kind of like abrupt kind of like breaks every now and then um, that Frank was causing. So I actually played um, that back to uh, the percussionist, and I asked him to improvise against <laughs> against the bumps and yeah. So he was actually playing with like um, a little um, thumb um, harp, yeah, um, and uh, brushes on on a snare, um, as well as um, a host of other kind of percussion instruments. And he was just listening and, and playing along. So when I mixed it in, it all feels as though it's uh, it's one continuous sound soundscape. So part of it was just kind of dealing with. Um, you know, the reality of, of the quality of the recording, um, but it actually produced the kind of magic that I'm actually really happy with. Yeah. Maybe one more? Anyone? 
Well, I mean, besides just the learning curve of, of, of working with the new technology, um, it was, I mean, I think you also noticed, like, with the, the, the pieces, I tend to work with a very, very still camera. And I think that, that references my, my background as a photographer. Um, so what to do with movement, what to do with the moving camera, that was something that I also really had to uh, struggle with. Um, and I found that um, I was interested in um, this, you know, this kind of hovering, a kind of, you know, really kind of subtle movement um, that both acknowledged that, that other shooting style, but also introduced something else, but not in a kind of crazy over dramatic way. Um, I also love the kind of ascent and descent as the camera's kind of getting into position. And that was stuff that I just recorded, you know, as I was getting the camera into position. But when I was reviewing the footage, I realized that it also made a kind of sense. So, I mean, it is, it's, it's, a, it's really um, interesting. And I think what needs to be kind of open and receptive to like understanding what the technology can do on its own, like what's its natural state, if you will. Um, and so um, even the, when the, there's a flick um, and there's a drum roll where the camera, so things like that, you know, they're not, they're not choreographed, they kind of happen. And uh, in the same way as, you know, with the score, you just kind of uh, allow improvisations to work their way into, into the piece, if that makes sense. Were you on a journey in the same way that Rosenberg was? Are you physically discovering things from between Boston and Atlanta? And were you, or did you have a map already in your mind of where you wanted to be? Well, in fact, I did all of my, um, so I knew um, that I would start the residency, the Russian residency, on a certain date. So I, I just backed up two weeks, because that's what I figured it would take to cover that much territory. I covered 17 cities. Um, uh, so uh, in some cases, they were close by, and I would shoot two in a day. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, Using the drone, there's just legal considerations. So um, what I did is I mapped out the um, um, certain points um, that I would, I knew I could get a clear shot of, of something of a landscape, as well as um, enough clearance, um, and it wouldn't be in an overly trafficked area. Um, so I did all of that using Google Earth, um, and so I had, you know, all of those points um, that I knew I had to go to as I entered a city then I would begin uh, shooting that footage. And then uh, I had an assistant with me who was shooting the ground footage simultaneously. Um, so while he was out covering the ground footage, uh, I was, I was uh, shooting the drone footage. And then we would come back together again after a couple of hours, and then just, again, improvise based on the location. Um, you know, I think uh, the last scene of the film is actually, um, we went to this scene in Atlanta, or this spot in Atlanta, and it proved to be not quite good. Um, but we drove around um, uh, a little bit, and we found actually uh, just this really beautiful street that had been abandoned. Like literally, the street had been the street goes maybe about 150 yards. There's no houses, but it's the street with the street lights and all of the infrastructure, but no houses, nothing. Um, so it's just, you know, this kind of forest around it and, you know, weeds and grass kind of growed up. Um, and I said, oh, you know, we, we drove by and we put that and kind of went over the fence and, and um, went, went on to it. And um, I knew I wanted to capture the street, but then when I actually went up, it was this amazing view of Atlanta, completely like this. In your work, when you put it in a space, um because you're like photographing these spaces and filming these spaces with these like ideological values and systems in place and then you're putting them into a space such as a gallery or a museum or an institute that already have these like preconceived ideas when you walk into like an art building or an art gallery and how do you kind of make the two work I guess? I don't know. Yeah. Just thinking as I'm asking. <laughs> well it's interesting. I mean I think you saw the um the show that I did at, um, uh, it was commissioned by LA, LAX Art. And, you know, when, when Lori, who commissioned the work, asked me, she said, come out and spend a few days um, in LA. You don't have to do the show in the gallery. You know, if you want to do the show somewhere else in the city, we'll, we'll make that happen for you. 
So I, I came out and spent a few days walking around, um, thinking about spaces, and um, um, the Bonaventure, because of my interest in Portman, John Portman, um, you know, I really kind of focused in on that, and we were able to make that happen. But it was such an important kind of, um, you know, so I designed the piece specifically for, uh, for that space um, after doing the site visit. Um, so making use of the, um, of the exterior windows, turning those into big light boxes, um, you know, even something as simple as in the space, I took out the lighting baffles so that the entire space was bathed in light evenly. Um, and it really felt as though the, sp the, the space was an extension of the piece. Um, so this was all stuff that I was thinking about actively while making the work um, and doing drawings and um, you know working with fabricators to see what was possible. Um, and then um, like pretty early on, uh, but at, definitely after you know um, I had already decided on the, the Bonaventure, I was approached by the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and, and they asked, can we take uh, take the, the piece and do an expanded version of it? Um, and again, you know, it was. I mean, it was a huge issue because the piece was reacting so specifically to the Bonaventure. Um, so again, you know, based on a site visit and trying to understand the space, I mean, one of the things that I found uh, incredibly inspirational was um, uh, Christopher Williams. Um, was, uh, he's not Chicago-based, actually, uh, <laughs> but he was based in LA and in Cologne. Um, he's um, he had just done a retrospective at the Art Institute of Chicago, and some of you might have seen it at the um, at MoMA. Um, and uh, Williams had done, he had worked and kind of infiltrated the infrastructure of the museum so thoroughly and kind of deconstructed it um, that it was really, it was interesting to see him kind of poking and, as I said, kind of insinuating himself into, the, into that structure. Um, and in some ways, for me, um, the installation at the uh, Art Institute was a response to that, to his kind of guidance and showing, you know, how the institution can reflect itself and its histories. Um, so, uh, without going into too much detail, I mean, there were a lot of very kind of specific moves that I was making um, in the um, in the in the show. Um, Williams had taken those modular walls and laid some of them flat. In fact, he'd actually taken one of the modular walls from the Chicago show and showed it at MoMA, and then it went onto White Chapel. So what I did is I actually took um, the very dimensions of that module, uh, that modular wall, and then used it um, for where the curtain wall anchors into the ceiling. So the actual width of the windows in the in the curtain wall are in direct response to the. Um, uh, the modular wall, and in fact, the span of the of the legs holding up the video monitors use the same system. So these are really kind of discrete moves that I don't expect anybody to really notice, but for me, I get a kick out of it, and I think a, a kind of funny and cool um, kind of um, culmination of, of that effort is the the piece. Um, that whole installation was actually purchased by MoMA, um, and I actually uh, when when I originally built, um, or had the, had the wall built, it was built on site, and they had to destroy it because they couldn't get it out afterwards. Um, so actually, one of the things that I did when I was down in Rauschenberg is I rebuilt that wall as a modular, <laughs> something modular, that then went into separate crates and can be rebuilt. But it's actually, um, the height of it is in response to the galleries in MoMA. So you're always you know, negotiating these realities and trying to make the, the piece work. Um, what's driving it is the integrity of the work, obviously, but you know you are trying to also kind of accommodate these different conditions. Um, an earlier body of work, Straylight, um, it started off as a commission from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and then it toured to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, the Henry in Seattle, and uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem. And um, each each uh, gallery that it was shown in had its own kind of specificities that I was really, it, it, you learn a lot, you learn a lot seeing a piece in these different, you know, environments and, and uh, um, yeah. Is, is Don, 